Hi, my amazing souls. It's your blissful soul, Katrina WW4. Wajiko, look at that lovely chiquita. <laughs> I welcome you and I welcome you back to this YouTube channel for another exciting episode. If you're new here, you've never been here before. Thank you so much for stopping by. Do watch the video till the end kindly. And also, do consider subscribing so that you join the Katrina W family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for all my returning subscribers, thank you so, so, so much for the love. Thank you for always appreciating my content. I am super, super grateful. Yes, and I love you so, so, so much. Thank you so much. As you will be watching today's content, kindly do like the video. Please, right now, just like the video. I've told you a billion and one times. It does a lot to um, a channel when you like the content. Just press like. All right? Yeah, thank you. And also subscribe if you haven't. And share with everyone. Okay? Let's grow together. Then leave me a positive comment about today's video. Now... I am at the People Dialogue Festival. Today is day two. Day two was on um, Thursday. Yes. And today my main focus, of course, I'm a person with disability. Guess, 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 guess. Yes. Today's focus for me was at the uh, youth village where the United Disabled Persons of Kenya were having a, a panel discussion around disability inclusion and education, you know. So, of course, that is where I was drawn and that is where I'm heading. I showed you yesterday all these tents, uh, different uh, political parties, different organizations, you know, different uh, brands and companies. And you are free to do what? To enter any that you felt you like look at cookie having a good time yeah here we have mr paul butiter just fame the cp queen and her guider here yeah, people are filling up uh here at this uh, tent for the youth village where udpk was having a panel who doesn't want to know more about uh what udpk is doing you know for the advancement of disability inclusion, you know. Yeah, so a lot of people were here. And like I told you yesterday, what a festival without music. So there was music and dancing, all right. Yes, it's a festival. Ah, oh, look at that. Look at Karen and Alice. <laughs> Ah, people got moves here, but uh, I cut the dances to, to the end. So it's just this one, and then we get to the discussions. They are beautiful. There goes our mama, Alice and Karen there. Yes, so after this, uh, let me take you to the tent. They had a tent also. Yes, UDPK had attend the uh, United Disabled Persons of Kenya and again Josephine and um, Koki are here of course you've got Alan the super photographer of UDPK you've got Faith and Zisa Josephine's guide so here that's the UDPK's uh, vision and mission and of course, we had here very, very wonderful materials that would uh, tell you more about UDPK, the works they've been doing, you know, the partners and everything. And here is Anthony. But yeah, so here are our materials. So anyone who came to the desk got to learn anything and everything they called about UDPK. You got to... Carry these uh, books to go and learn more on your own, which was very wonderful. You know, this was wonderful. I have mine here. Uh, once uh, I'm less busy, I'm going to check them out. Let's head to the speeches now. Come and understand 
more about the partnership and education and inclusion of persons with disabilities. So today I have my amazing panelists on board who are going to take us through different areas um, revolving around inclusive education and I'd love them to just do a quick round of introductions before we start. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi everyone. Hi. Psych Germany. Psych. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm the chairperson of Different Re Talented Society of Kenya. I'm also a board member of United Disabled Persons of Kenya UDPK and a mother to a 19 year old autistic young adult. Thank you. Abarizenu. Zuri. Abarizenu Tena. Zuri. Sasa Mimi Naito and Joseph Owino. Uh, I'm English. I'm just a winner. I'm a uh, person. I'm first student, uh, university student that is, and uh, I also get the privilege to chair the university and college student student and special needs association of Kenya as a student union that brings together student disabilities from fund wide universities and the colleges in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. And I'd love us to start because we are running a bit behind time. And I'd first of all start with Joseph. Um, you've mentioned that you lead an organization of universities and college students with special needs. Um, what are some of the barriers that young people with disabilities face um, in the education system? And linking that also with the aspects of, in terms of relevance to the job market, how does the transition look like? What are the barriers? What's the transition and yeah. Thank you so much. To start with, uh, coming from a uh, higher educational sector that is uh, covering the university and the colleges in the country, I know education is a process. Uh, you can't just wake up and find yourself in a college or university at uh, the moment you are admitted to school. You start off uh, within uh, basic education institutions. You start from ECD, you get to primary school, you transition to secondary school, then get to either college, and or university, and now transition from that place where you've gotten and acquired your uh, requisite skills, then you get to see how you can uh, get to the job market. And so, looking into all this perspective, you we must harness the prospect of, you know, like uh, how are we ensuring that uh, as learners with disabilities, we get that which is uh, set for us, uh, because we have a number of provisions that are set by a number of stakeholders, a uh, number of uh, institutions. Key among them is the government. Through the Ministry of Education, we have the parliament that set the laws for us. Uh, for example, we have the Universities Act that you know, like controls the operation of the higher educational institutions in the country. We must look into when, for student disabilities, how do we enhance transition? Because the transition affects our placing within the higher education institutions. Then after, when we are in the higher educational scope, how do we ensure that there is an all down development system or structure within our universities and colleges, so that when uh, student disability again gets out of these gets out of these uh, high education institutions, then transition into the job market, there is also an avenue because you find that we have the constitution provides through Article fifty four of the constitution, uh, clause two that uh, there is the reservation of five uh, percent job reservation for persons abilities. We, we are having a challenge because you can't get to actualize this because, just because uh, nobody can employ you just because you have disability. But your skills and uh, qualifications comes first. And so when we, are, when, like, uh, when we don't have proper systems to ensure that education for persons with disabilities within our universities are enhanced, then we are sure that we want to be able to enhance the employment of persons with disabilities as per the provision of the constitution. And so we get to miss because we don't have stringent policies. We don't, we don't have stringent measures that are put in place to enhance the transition from our basic education institutions to the higher learning institutions and from the higher learning, higher learning institutions to the workplace. That is uh, what uh, I have in that. Thank you so much for that. And I think that has highlighted um, the challenges that young people face within that sector. And maybe if I could go to um, a panelist who has just walked in, Raydon Shitambati, you can first of all start by introducing yourself and then just highlight for us the barriers that are persons from underrepresented groups within disability. What are the challenges that the deaf, blind, what autistic persons and persons with intellectual disabilities, what are the challenges that they face? And being that um, they, don't, they don't go through the regular system, what are the challenges 
in regards to that. Thank you so much, Sandra. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Raydon Ashitambasi. I'm from the uh, Kenya National Association of the Deafblind and uh, the United Disabled Persons of Kenya. And uh, we persons with deaf blindness and uh, the underrepresented group in general, we face um, lack of skilled teachers to handle uh, to handle these people because uh, you see, inclusive education requires inclusive learning, and uh, you know, inclusive learning requires teachers to have skills to deal with persons. Who, I mean, to deal with diverse people. Because there are people who take time to learn, there are people who take time to process information, and especially uh, autistic people. You know, the the the, the, the different spectrum spectrum of autistic people. So they take time to process and digest information. So when a teacher teaches a syllabus quickly, other people are left behind, and same case happens to people who are deafblind. Some teachers do not know how to read and write in Braille. So when when we when a, when a student writes, this teacher marks without even understanding what this student has has written and have experienced this. So skill lack of skilled teachers is a uh, is a challenge that we are facing, and uh, the learning environment is not conducive for our needs. Like for for example, um. Persons who are deaf blind do not have hearing aids, and this is what we call reasonable accommodation. For a learning to be inclusive, there has to be reasonable accommodation. Teachers, teachers, head teachers, house mothers have to be supportive to the environment of these uh, uh, diverse people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raydon, for that. And I think you've brought out a very important aspect, the aspect of reasonable accommodation. And we usually preach this a lot in our spaces. And when you talk about accommodating persons with diverse disabilities, then what does this mean for those who most times we tend to forget? When we talk about persons with intellectual impairments, the, the aspects like the easy read materials, aspects like support persons, when you're talking about autistic persons, what are the modalities that we use when in our trainings and in our learning curriculum? When you're talking about aspects like those assistive technologies like the hearing aid, um, ensuring that all these aspects um, are taken into consideration to ensure that we are not leaving anyone behind. So now I'll go to Alice and I'd also want you to highlight uh, a bit of the barriers um, for, for autistic persons and also in terms of policy. What existing policies do we currently have in the education space and what, what are the gaps and what are the probable what are the probable recommendations that you would suggest that could maybe um, help in, in, in ensuring that education is inclusive for persons with diverse disabilities? Uh, thank you so much, Sadra. Uh, good morning, everyone, once again. Good morning. Um, I would say that um, autistic persons, persons with intellectual disabilities, and persons with other developmental disabilities in the classroom setting experience a lot of challenges. And one of the key issues, uh, probably I would start with the policy. Uh, the Basic Education Act provides for education for learners at an early age, that is um, a pre primary and primary level. Uh, we also know we also have the sector policy for learners uh, and trainees with disabilities, 2018, under the Ministry of Education. Uh, we also have the the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Article 24 of the Con Con Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that talks around matters of inclusive education and provision of quality education for persons with disabilities. We also have SDG 4 that speaks to matters of inclusive education. But then even with this policy framework that is a very broad policy framework and legal framework, we learners with disabilities and especially learners with autism, intellectual disabilities and other developmental disabilities continue to experience a lot of difficulties in the learning system. And one of the key issues um, begins at an early age when children are being assessed and placed into schools. So one of the key gaps we have is around assessment, around the curriculum, around um, how children are placed 
uh, within institutions. And this is where we find that learners with autism, learners with intellectual disabilities get to be excluded from the school system on the basis of their diagnosis. Like when a learner presents, the parent, the caregiver comes in and presents uh, the disability card that shows that this learner has a certain domain of disability. The basic assumption is that this learner will not be accommodated within the mainstream school, but then has to go to a segregated unit. And I know that cuts across uh, many persons with disabilities. Also, we have difficulties. We have difficulties there when it comes to assessment in terms of staffing. Uh, we have very few staff that have been placed within the education assessment and resource centers across the country. We have uh, 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 difficulties there when it comes also to, to funding of the uh, education assessment resource centers. And remember that early intervention is very, very key because if a child misses a milestone, then uh, what my good colleague was talking about in terms of placement into the higher institution of learning, it means that when you miss out on your basic rights at the initial stage, it means that you cannot be able to transition into other levels of learning. So I think this has been a key challenge. We also have a challenge when it comes to training of teachers on inclusive education. We know currently the government also has done very well in terms of ensuring that it has come up with an inclusive education handbook under the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. But this handbook is being trained to teachers who are actually in the training institutions. But then the teachers who are in service already, many of them do not even understand the concept of inclusive education. And many of them assume that learners with disabilities are supposed to be put in a segregated unit. When we talk about inclusive education today, we are talking about accommodating all learners, learners with diverse needs. I know my colleague referred to that within one classroom setting, providing reasonable accommodation, providing support. I know my colleague spoke to that, providing materials that are easy to read, materials that are in graphics, materials that are in pictorial format that makes it easy, easy for this learner to be able to learn. We find that there's quite a lot when it comes also to the curriculum. And I will speak to the CPC curriculum because it provides for two levels of learning for learners. That one that is age-based where the child proceeds and sits, the learner proceeds and sits for the Kipsea, what they call the Kipsea uh, examination. And there's also the age-based, there's also the stage-based pathway that provides for the learner to transition within the Kilea uh, pathway or the Kenya Intermediate Learners Education Assessment. So what is happening is many of the learners that proceed within the state-based curriculum who are learners with disabilities, during assessment, many learners who would probably fit into uh, the CPC curriculum and sit alongside their peers, uh, the KIPSEA examinations, are put on the stage-based pathway. So meaning that you can find an 80-year-old and a 20-year-old within a special unit learning the same things. You can find even a 28-year-old who is still in a special unit and has not been ready to sit for an examination. They are still getting prepared for sitting an examination. So what is happening is many of these learners with autism and intellectual disabilities over time have exited the school system without certification. We also recognize that the government signed a policy in the beginning of this year on matters of recognition of prior running. So we would want to see that implemented because um, uh, learners who, uh, who have already exited the school system without certification also need to get into work uh, within their areas of interest, within their areas of strength, and be accommodated in learning institutions under the cognition of prior learning. Uh, we also know there has been gaps when it comes to provision of vocational, the pre-vocational and vocational uh, training for learners with disabilities, and especially this group of learners um, with autism and intellectual disabilities. But we also recognize that um, uh, through uh, the work of uh, the donor community also, we have seen also interventions and partnerships between uh, the donor communities and organizations like uh, uh, UDPK, DTSK, and others 
uh, who have and sight savers and others and the consortium of organizations that have come together to have programs within the National Industrial Training Authority. Uh, and I know the National Tra Industrial Training Authority that trains for the labor market has been quite receptive when it comes to training of learners with uh, um, disabilities in their setting across diverse uh, disabilities. So we also agree that Yes, there has been uh, uh, quite a lot that is happening, but we agree that a lot needs to be done in terms of training of teachers. A lot needs to be done in terms of funding and staffing, and especially on matters of assessment, uh, matters of uh, schools, and also transitioning from segregated units, the special units, to ensure that all learners can be included in, within the same setting and provided support and accommodations to learn alongside uh, their peers. Uh, my experience with young adults who went into the NITA program was that many of them really enjoyed for the first time they were able to learn alongside their peers uh, in an inclusive setting and they keep wanting to go back into the institution. They have been discriminated, they have been in the segregated units for too long uh, and when they get into the inclusive units they are happy to be there and to be trained alongside their peers. And we know this is um, what the Constitution envisages, that learners will be provided uh, with quality and inclusive education within the same setting. So, so as my colleague said, in terms of infrastructure, so there's quite a lot that needs to be done, but then we also agree that there's also what is happening and what needs to be proved on. We also will talk about capitation for learners, you know, increasing the capitation uh, because uh, the capitation sometimes does not take care or does not take into consideration the disability related costs and the and provision, things like provision of therapy within uh, the school, the school units because a lot of time hours is spent when children are taken from the school system to therapy uh, within hospitals within their vicinity, while there would be partnerships between the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education to provide mobile therapy within the schools so that children can be able to learn and also get provided with the relevant services that they require within the classroom setting. So thank you very much, Sandra. I know I've talked too much, thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. And I think you've had elaborated quite exhaustively aspects to do with the policies that currently exist and even the situation as is. And I love the fact that you've highlighted, yes, we have made some milestones, but the, uh, the fact that we are still more inclined to the segregated form of education is still a challenge. And we, we realize that education plays a key role in the grooming of, 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 young people and especially from that early stage so having inclusive education ensures that we not only create awareness to other people without disabilities on matters disability but we're also ensuring that these young people with disabilities are able to actually um, um, participate meaningfully in that setup of the society and they are able to integrate with their peers. Um, so thank you so much for that elaborate um, elaborate presentation. And even as I move to Valerie, you've mentioned that you work with Enable and you deal a lot with assistive technology. What exactly is assistive technology and what's, what's, what's the role of assistive technology in enhancing the agenda behind inclusive education. Thank you very much, Sandra. And um, yes, I work with Enable Africa, which is an organization that empowers youth uh, with disability through computer technology to ensure that uh, they fit uh, equally with other people in the education sector. So that is fostering inclusivity in the education sector. Assistive technology on its own refers to uh, designing products and services that are fit for any diverse disability, which are to include persons using wheelchairs, persons with visual impairment. So at Enable Africa, we partner with schools for learners with visual impairment to ensure that we provide computer skills, that is ICT, adapted ICT skills, to ensure these learners competently fit in the education sector without being discriminated. So we ensure that learners uh, from tender ages are able to acquire these skills so that they can effectively communicate they can independently use a computer with, with minimal or no assistance. They can foster, uh, they can fit in the inclusive education sector 
uh, without any discrimination or without any segregation. So we ensure that um, all the skills uh, pertaining computer, these learners are make sure, we make sure that they acquire them. So um, for myself, I'm based at Thika School for the Visually Impaired. Myself, I'm also visually impaired. So you can imagine a person with visual impairment, you're able to communicate effectively to your peers, you're able to send emails, you're able to receive emails, and that is what we ensure that uh, people transition knowing that uh, the, the world is going digital, so they are also fitting in the digital world. So um, we make sure that you are very well fit to transition even to the tertiary institutions and you are not um, having difficulties even to uh, do your assignments at school, communicate to your lecturers or even uh, communicate to your peers. So uh, with assistive technology, we ensure people with visual impairment in that sector are very well equipped with the knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie, for, I, I believe we were all hearing assistive technology and everyone was wondering what's assistive technology. So she has just highlighted, it's, it's basically the technology that has been adapted so that it can enable persons with disabilities to participate on an equal level with other people. I also have visual impairment and I operate, I work, I use my laptop, I use my phone and I'm able to undertake my daily duties just like anyone else. So those are some of the privileges that come with assistive technology. But of course, it also has its challenges because assistive technology has a cost. For example, if you would, um, and, and Valerie, maybe you could also um, talk more on this in terms of the cost, how much do all these... Um... Okay, thank you very much, Sandra. Um... As she has just mentioned, assistive technology on its own has its challenges. And uh, the first one she has mentioned, cost. It is very expensive to adapt um, technology to a person with a disability. So that is where we get, it is very expensive to, for instance, purchase a laptop. And uh, this laptop is accommodative to uh, a person with visual impairment. So we use different softwares to ensure that a uh, person with visual impairment are able to operate that laptop just the same way um, someone with, with no visual impairment can operate. So there is a software by the name JOS, that is Job Access with Speech, that we need to purchase, and it is very expensive. So cost-wise, uh, assistive technology um, is very, very costly. And then uh, at the design level, when you don't um, integrate person with disability, you don't get the best products for these people. So at the design level, a person with disability need not to be segregated because they have now the full idea of what what kind of a product they need in the market. So uh, Enable Africa also set its accessibility standards in 2022 to ensure that uh, when designers are uh, designing their products, they include a person with disability at the design level. Because when you leave out these people, who are you designing this product for? You will design a product that will not fit someone in the market uh, who, who has a disability. So at the design level with the accessibility standard set, you'll be able to design a very good product for person with disability. And then another challenge is um, accessibility to the knowledge as well. Person with disability tend to not to get accessible information. So you, you are not able to get information only because the information is not accessible to you. So when the information is accessible, for instance, our MC was, was asking a question, who uh, in this um, congregation, in their school, they had sign language. You know, sign language is an accommodative language for persons with hearing impairment. Who in their school or who has gone a milestone to ensure that they know sign language? as well as Braille, who knows Braille so that you can accommodate that person with visual impairment. So accessibility in the inclusivity sector is very, very, very much a key for everyone to ensure that you set accessible standards for persons with disability to be able to achieve what they need. Thank you so much for highlighting that and I believe that's another gap. We've noticed that assistive technology has a cost and of course that, 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 that means that not 
a, a, a huge number of persons with disabilities are often left out in terms of access. And what this then means is that also in terms of inclusive education, then they have a challenge. Because in, in, And especially right now, even with the CBC curriculum and the way the world has shifted towards tech, then technology is very important. And if we don't have that aspect of assistive technology for persons with disabilities, then they miss out on a number of things. And even when we reflect at where we are at Kenya right now, like most of the government services have actually shifted to the e-citizen platform. So if we look at if there's no access to this e-citizen platform, if we look at some of these websites, if they're not accessible to autistic persons, if they're not accessible to persons with visual impairment and the diverse impairments, then what does that mean? It just means that we have a huge population that is going to be left out in terms of accessing some of these services. Um, and I love the fact that you've mentioned that it's very critical for us to actually engage organizations of persons with disabilities and persons with disabilities themselves to ensure that when we are designing some of these programs, when we are designing some of these innovations and initiatives, that they are part of that process so that then they are able to co we're able to co-create together and come up with solutions that are actually meaningful and can contribute to their to their sustainable livelihoods. So now as even I come I come back to Joseph, I just want you to quickly um, um, elaborate what what you're doing the capacity as an organization, as the universities and colleges, students association, what are you doing to advance um, the, what are we doing to advance um, inclusive education in terms of advocacy and even initiatives that you've done? Thank you so much. Uh, one, we are looking into how do we ensure that the voices of, of students abilities within our higher education, in, uh, higher education sector are enhanced to, to ensure that at least they are taken care of. One aspect within the facets of inclusive education is policy uh, development, policy inclusion, inclusion of the, the voices of disabilities within policy development. You find that uh, for far too long, uh, we've had uh, when stakeholders or you know, like uh, the key players, being the Ministry of Education and other co-stakeholders, get to converge to address or like uh, develop the policies to tap into you know, like uh, the welfare of learners with disabilities. They converge each and every stakeholder on board, but one critical uh, sector or one critical individual is left out. That is that student, that student or child with a disability. I know this is the person who will partake or, uh, the development of this policy or will partake the final product of this, uh, from this discussion. When my voice is left on something that pertains to me, that means that uh, uh, my issues are not taken into consideration because you must get the, my experience with the initial policy that was in existence and also get you know, like my, uh, my, my take on uh, whatever you are proposing or you want to bring on board. Like for example at the moment, uh, the Minister of Education is proposing a raft of policies that is in, uh, you know, like, uh, that is, uh, that is coming as a, as a casa to, you, know, like, uh, you see uh, the, after President, Uru, President uh, William Ruto was sworn into office he appointed a 42-member team uh, to what is uh, famously called the uh, Presidential Working Party on Education Reforms. Unfortunately, in this number of 42 uh, you know, like professionals within the education sector, we never had any voice of persons with disabilities within the education sector. Even from the Ministry of Education, there was, there was, no, there was no any individual you know, like, representing that capacity. Two, there was no even a student voicing. Not even that of student disabilities. They, even the larger student capacity, we didn't have a voice in. And these are people looking into, uh, you know, like uh, uh, they're proposing education reforms. So if uh, you just tell from the word go that it's ex exclusion from the word go. Uh, you know, like, it's not inclusive for, you know, like, from uh, the formation up to when we're getting the final product. And so that's why we are coming out strong to ensure that the voices of student disabilities that has, have always been forgotten and has always been placed as an afterthought is brought forward because our voices matter in our wealth, in addressing our welfare. We can't have you know, like people seated somewhere discussing about our welfare without our involvement. We must take part and be part and parcel of this engagement. And so even as the ministry proposes these uh, proposals through bills that are coming from parliament, uh, that are coming to parliament very soon, we are aiming at converging stakeholders, be uh, uh, stakeholders, be the government and non-government stakeholders, to ensure that we get the overboard, uh, we get you know, like uh, players from all these sectors 
converge and get you know, like to have a one strong point to ensure that when uh, the parliament gets to discuss about these issues, they have our voices on board. It. Another aspect is about infrastructure, and uh, I know my colleagues have talked about it. When you talk about infrastructural enhancement, we are not just uh, talking about uh, you know, like setting up of ramps and it's done. No. How do we ensure that even in the case of emergencies, you find that you go to buildings because our institutions have storied buildings or no, like where they use lifts. But funny enough is you'll even get a you'll even get a sticker or a kind of a messaging that tells you that in case of emergency, don't use lifts, use the stairs. You apart from the lifts, you only have stairs. There are no alternative of ramps. How do you how how will you know like ensure that if in case of emergency, fire outbreak, so you don't want lifts to be used. How will a person with, uh, with you know, like person on a wheelchair with physical disability using crutches maneuver in case of such an emergency? We must ensure that such uh, uh, such issues are taken into consideration in terms of infrastructural uh, infrastructural enhancement that is taking care of the built environment and the technological enhancement, so that we bridge the gap to uh, we bridge the gap that are aimed at enhancing inclusion of persons with disabilities. When finalizing, we must also look into how do we harness the talent of the talent and the skills of learners with disabilities. When we get into our education institutions, it's not just about book work from eight to five. We must ensure that there's a student we, we are building a student inside the classroom and outside the classroom. How do we harness the gifts that these students have? Uh, from you know, like, uh, can can these students do sports? Can these these students do you know, like something that's uh, music or art oriented to ensure that if at all you know like education comes as a breeding ground for them to know that this is my basic, this is my skill that I can perfect in and even get a living from it. We have perfect examples in this country and beyond that have you no know, like you, you you can't even name you know like their degrees or whatever they studied in school or even their schools that they studied in. But there are names that uh, there are names that are recognized in the country. If I ask you, Henry Wanyoike, can somebody tell me the school he went to, or can you confirm to me that if he has a degree, but you know him from the perspective of he is a legendary sports person, irrespective of his disability? When we talk of someone like Crystal Lasigi, you know, is currently is a parliamentarian. She is a parliamentarian. Uh, can you tell her the university she went to, or even the uh, the secondary or primary school she went to, but you know her as an artist? We can somebody tell me, you know, like the school DJ Euphoric went to. You know, he's a person with disability, but now you know, like you don't know his school, but it is because of his talent and gifts that has built his brand. You know, so we must also ensure that we tap into the talent and the skill of these persons. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very important aspect: recognizing talents um, beyond the classroom level. And now to Alice, you've mentioned that you represent both DTSK and UDPK. Maybe if you could share with us um, what 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 initiatives or what are you doing? And I love that you shared the learnings around um, the the initiative at NITA for autistic persons. What what initiatives are you doing to advance? inclusive education for learners and trainees with uh, Thank you very much, Sandra. I know quite a lot is happening within UDPK uh, in terms of advocacy, awareness raising and partnerships and collaborations uh, to enhance um, um, the skills for learners, uh, for trainees across board. Uh, but uh, in different talented society of Kenya, we also have quite a number of initiatives and we are very keen on socio-economic empowerment of young adults with autism and intellectual disabilities and other uh, developmental disabilities. Um, one of the initiatives that we have that uh, have uh, is one to ensure that uh, the young adults self-advocate for themselves on matters that concern them. Uh, so bringing together young adults to self-advocate and uh, the other one concerns social economic empowerment of young adults. So through a paired approach where uh, the family member is able to the family is able to identify uh, if the young learner, young adult requires uh, some form of support, then the family can identify someone to be paired with to learn alongside them. So in this uh, specific initiative uh, that was under the National Industrial Training Authority, uh, we had um, quite a number of young adults and then we had um, their support persons who most likely were caregivers 
uh, they could be siblings, they could be mothers, they could be fathers, they could be any family member, either a peer or even um, a, a, fam, a parent or, 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 or someone who's been identified by the family. So what was happening is they trained alongside the various skills, whether it's food and beverage, uh, uh, artisan courses like plumbing, uh, automotive engineering, IT, um, uh, painting, and all the courses. So the, the program ensures that young adults who have exited the school system without any form of certifications can go into a government-oriented institutions and train within their areas of interest, uh, their areas of, of, of talent. Uh, so you can you could find like um, a, um, a young man and the brother uh, training in plumbing, and then they can be able to do uh, uh, initiatives together and move into micro enterprise or get even into gainful employment alongside each other. So, so these initiatives tend to break the barriers that exist within society that assumes that learners with autism and intellectual disabilities cannot transition where they do not have uh, certificates. We recognize that the con Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities envisages lifelong learning, that at any point in time, a young adult should be allowed to, to learn within their areas of interest and get into gainful employment. So ours is to encourage independent living. Ours is to encourage families to support their young adults to transition, to earn a living, to get into, into work, whether they have high support needs or not. Uh, the family can provide support and educational institutions, we would encourage educational institutions also to provide the requisite support and accommodations. And many um, vocational institutions and higher institutions of learning should be keen to understand this specific community and give them an opportunity on the basis of recognition of prior learning, even where they have exited the school system with the, without any form of certificates. We also acknowledge that quite uh, there are still a small number that has been able to get uh, into gainful employment. And I want to recognize uh, my good colleague and our secretary, organizing secretary, Madam Karen Morioki, who is a neurodiverse consultant working for Ubongo and who is um, one of our key members in the committee of United Disabled Persons, uh, uh, Different Talented Society of Kenya. Also, we have an initiative with Talanta Institute where we've seen quite a number of young learners also get and, and uh, train in DJing and music. And uh, we realize that many government institutions do not provide this specific type of courses, but provide the, the traditional courses. So we know this hope, and this is these are initiatives that we would want the government to take up so that learners can trainees and learners can be able to transition. And uh, I know we, we, we did discuss about transition at all levels. So, so we would want to see many young adults transition into work because what is happening is many young adults, if they do not get into work, they then start developing secondary psychosocial disabilities. We find their caregivers also developing uh, secondary um, psychosocial disabilities that they didn't have because they have to spend time and many of them quitting jobs to take care of young adults who would probably just transition and get into independent living. And the question we keep asking ourselves, why globally are autistic adults working within Google, within Microsoft, within uh, JP Morgan, within Uber, within other high technology based organizations? because they have existed the school system with requisite skill sets as their peers because they got accommodated at an early age, they got supported, but then uh, the only thing they require to get into the workplace is reasonable accommodation. So I think we can do quite a lot. And this is um, a community that, that if well protected, have a lot of skills, have a lot of talents, have a lot of interests. Thank you. So a skill-based, uh, you know, a user-centered, strength-based approach uh, would be uh, uh, good when it comes to this community. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alice. And I think she's brought it out very well, the aspect of the inclusive curriculum, how we are looking at the requisite skills and how we are linking that to transition. And of course, she's also highlighted the gaps in terms of how autistic persons locally here, the difference between um, autistic persons here and those that are abroad. So it would be very good for us to actually integrate some of those best practices in our curriculums to ensure that we are not leaving anyone behind and of course the aspect around the advocacy the creating awareness and just being intentional about including persons with disabilities then now to valerie very briefly on the role of i know you've mentioned that you work with at speaker school for the blind which is a segregated um, um form of, of form which is a segregated um, sector. So, what what role is enabled? What 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 is enabled doing to ensure that we are advancing the um, assistive technology aspect in other sectors that are not segregated? What are we doing in terms of inclusive education to ensure that that, that aspect of in, in of assistive technology is being integrated in other systems? Uh, thank you very much, Sandra, for that. Uh some questions. So uh, Enable Africa is ensuring that uh, we partner with uh, like-minded organizations to ensure that uh, assistive technology is not only uh, is not only seen at the education institutions but also uh, realized out there. So we ensure that um, to preach this gospel high, uh, Enable Africa uh, holds its annual inclusive African conference every year. So our inclusive conference this year is uh, on the 14th, 15th and 16th of May. So we also encourage everyone to make sure you register and attend so that you can also get more information about digital literacy, inclusivity in the education sector as well as accessibility. So I encourage um, partnering, collaboration with other organizations to ensure that we spread this gospel very wide to reach to other sectors that are not segregated. As per now, um, we are also ensuring that we we encroach the hearing impairments um, sector to ensure that uh, even the assistive technology is not only uh, to the visually impaired but also to other disabilities. So Enable is ensuring that uh, we bring on board partners that can help us um, get to other disabilities, uh, even to other, as you mentioned, to other sectors that are not segregated. So we are bringing on board very many partners to ensure we foster, even we bring on board employed uh, or skilled labor to to give us um, information that uh, we, we may not have to ensure that we we get to other sectors that um, are segregated or not segregated. So our uh, employment also at Enable Africa is uh, diverse. We bring on board people with different disabilities to ensure that we are not not only spreading the gospel to the visually impaired, but to other disabled people. Uh, so we bring on board uh, other people to be employed with us so that we can create the picture out there to, to other people that we are an inclusive society. Uh, on education matters, uh, we feel that uh, inclusive education touches very importantly on persons with visual impairment, persons with um, hearing impairment. Those are people that we feel they are left behind. So Enable is, as I mentioned, encroaching the hearing impairment uh, sector to ensure that uh, we broaden the assistive technology pathway for the hearing impairment. We bring assistive technology to their baseline so, so that they can also uh, inclusively participate well in the education sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that. And now moving to Radon, being being a Gen Z, we've said in Youth Village, Cindy, oh, this is Youth Village, being a Gen Z, um, and you've highlighted the barriers that you face as a person who's deafblind. What are you doing in your capacity as a young person just to create awareness within your peer networks on the importance of inclusive education? What are you doing and just to ensure that um, the voices of young people in terms of their needs and their um, and their opinions is actually taken into consideration. Thank you. Good question. So, uh, in my capacity, in my capacity, I do engage in dialectic conversations with people, and I also uh, do some online writings that are centered on inclusion and inclusive education. 
and uh, I do I, I, I do like I said earlier I do engage in dialectic conversations like this th th this is person to person uh, dialogue on importance of in inclusion why 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 we persons with disabilities are left behind and why teachers need to be inclusive and i i, I do engage in we I, I do engage with teachers with teachers uh who do not understand or who uh did not have prior knowledge as to why why learning should be inclusive and uh in most cases, I engage with visual impaired teachers because uh, these are the t teachers that are close, uh, that, that, that are mostly in my network. So I do engage with them. Yeah, that's so far, I can say. Okay, thank you so much for that. And I believe our panelists have shared a lot of insights in terms of what is currently existing, the legal frameworks that are there, and they've also suggested, they've made a number of recommendations in terms of how do we progress to ensure that education is inclusive. And we've, they've talked about the aspect of, of recognizing persons with disabilities as persons first, who are entitled to rights such as rights to education. So that aspect of inclusive education is a right that persons with disabilities are entitled to. And of course, it comes with all the other aspects of reasonable accommodation and, and, and the inclusivity that is needed to ensure that happens. So I'd love to now go to our audience just to get a feel of, of if you'd have any questions or if you have a comment that you can make as we about to round up. Hi guys. Hi. Let me introduce myself. My name is Karen Muruki. I am autistic and I do work at Ubongo uh, International. There are, it's an NGO based in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. I work there as a neurodiversity consultant. Mine is a comment and of course a submission. Uh, what I do there is uh, part of what I'm doing there at Bongo. I do especially mentor interns who are on autistic, just like myself. And uh, I just help them in matters to do with workplace skills, soft skills training, what they're doing. It's just, uh, just to mentor them to at least cope with the environment around the workplace, how to be able to self-advocate for themselves, because these are some of the challenges, just like what we're facing here, it matters to do with transitioning and many of them and they're two autistic uh, adults who have just transitioned from school so the difficult challenges that they face is just the transitioning bit from one stage to another like to just transition from the school to the workplace setting so my work there is to mentor them in now just coming out of the school setting which they are very used to to now understand, uh, to now get into the hands-on skills that like to uh, what they are doing based on their areas of interest in at Bongo. So I train them on that. I also train them also on uh, how to uh, be very confident in themselves, how to be able to communicate their needs. If they are struggling, let them be very uh, at least just be able to articulate their needs, especially in matters to do with their reasonable accommodation. That is also part of what we do at Bongo. So that is just a brief of what I do. I know I I really want to elaborate, but just what I do at Bongo is just to mentor the interns during that time there and to enhance a very smooth uh, transition into the workplace. And once they come out from the internship at Bongo, they'll be able to gain the skills, not only the employability skills, but also to make sure that they are able to now enhance what they've learned at Bongo to now learn how to be very independent and also to apply for meaningful jobs as autistic and neurodivergent people. So that is the antithesis of uh, what we do. Um, and we hope that uh, the mentorship program actually is one of the things that we really aim for because we don't have that. Obviously, especially in the neurodivergent community, once they've finished school, the question we ask ourselves, what next? How are we able to uh, enhance mentorship 
not only to the neurodiverse communities, but also to persons with diverse disabilities. What are the things that they need to have once they've transitioned from school to an, a workplace setting? What are those skills that we need to have? And that is why I spoke a little bit about the mentorship we do at Bongo. And we hope that this, the, the idea of mentorship should be done here in Kenya. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is uh, Karen Jero. I am a certified counselor. I'm also a policy leader with uh, Siasa Place. Um, I would love to first of all thank the panelists for the articulation and the level of knowledge you have. Um, I, I was looking on social media and I found a complaint by one of the parents complaining that she took a child to a high school. I won't mention because I'm not uh, in the legal uh, side. So the parent took the person, a person who was disabled, a child, and uh, the principal was uh, behaving in a manner that was not acceptable because she complained that she doesn't deal with such people. Looking at that, I felt so bad because one for one a principal with the level of education they're not supposed to behave in such a manner however i'm not to blame the principal this is because the society doesn't have the necessary knowledge it requires to be able to accept and to be able to uh, bring in inclusion when it comes to persons with disabilities this brings me uh, brings me to the question uh for joseph and uh the lady at the center, sorry I didn't get your name. Uh, what should, because you all mentioned of what we as uh, the society should do or what persons with disabilities need, but we've not had the aspect where what the society needs, because the society seems not to be ready to receive these people in the society, to accept them and to bring in inclusion, because the society is uh, thriving on stereotype information, disinformation and uh, an aspect of level of education where they are not literate according to uh, in, in terms where they are supposed to bring in inclusion. So what is your take, Joseph? Because as we look at since we studied in primary, the MC started by indicating that most of us didn't study in places where there was inclusivity, that is in primary, secondary and now even higher education. So what can be done for the society to be educated? Because you've all spoken, I think, of something I would view as education on books, but what do we do to the society? Or how do we curate information to be able to reach the society so that they are able to bring in inclusion and ensure that persons with disabilities are part of us? Good morning, everyone. My name is Lodge. I have a question and mine is more of I'm seeking information and ideas from the panel. I recognize the efforts that are being made for inclusive education by various agents. You've talked about uh, pairing uh, dis learners with disability with support systems so that they can be able to excel in their studies. You've talked about the inclusive initiative by NITA for autistic learners. There are even efforts by Enable Africa to accommodate the hearing impaired as part of your programs. But then I feel like there is a need for a system and a mindset shift, especially for learners with hearing impairment, because um, the process for application for higher institutions is going on, right? And I recognize that we have three institutions in the country that cater to deaf students. That is Sikri, St. Joseph, and Karen Technical Institute for the Deaf. So I am seeking information in terms of what are the options for deaf students when it comes to schools and when it comes to courses. Because when us who are abled, when we are applying for university, you'll get a booklet with almost 100 courses. But when it's a deaf student, you get a two-page document with less than 50 courses. So what, what happens to their interests? What happens to their talents? Because 
if a deaf student wanted to study media and communications, their families would have to dig deep to hire an assign, in, assign language interpreter to go with them to class so that they can get that. And even then, they're not assured that the employer will hire them because the employer is looking at cost. So what happens to deaf students? Um, Championing specifically for deaf students because I have a sibling who's deaf and mute and this has been our struggle all through from um, primary education up to now when we are selecting courses and his interests are nowhere on the two page document of courses we have because then he has welding or uh, tailoring or garment making or culinary arts. And I'm not saying those are bad courses. I'm just thinking these are not his interests. Then he has three schools to choose from. Three. And as a bold person, how many schools do we have? We have so many. So I am seeking information in terms of what are their options and what do we need to do? Because evidently there needs to be a system and a mindset shift. Thank you. Thank you for the condition of the chance. My name, I'm Levi Cabeza from Pika School for Fishery in Bell. So mine was to ask about the formative of inclusivity for the allocation of resources. How can we make sure that this is followed? What are the steps that you have taken so that we can get the resources? It's like when they are at the school, like we do spend a whole time without writing because we don't have the pre papers and what I now for months they don't have these machines that we you we do use in the writings. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is uh, Owen from Deca High School for the Vision Impaired. Uh, mine is just a concern for these uh, brothers and sisters who are visually impaired because uh, the government says that they have allocated funds that are supposed to be sent to our schools which are uh, supposed to buy the resources we need and uh, uh, to buy the resources we need uh, which we will use in order to learn and write. But then, as my brother here, Kabesa, said, uh, we are having shortage of braille machines and braille papers, whereby the former students cannot write because they don't have the necessities. Then, the seats, they don't have seats, so they spend the whole lessons standing. Uh, then, we'll, the government is, is uh, strong on ideas but weak on implementation because they say we will do this, we will do that for you. But after a period of time, nothing changes. We still remain with the same problems in our schools. So I was just urging that uh, please be strong on the implementation of your ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Santi. Who's next? And I'd encourage the students here yeah? engage. His space, Nienu. We need to hear from you. We need to hear your experiences. Engage, engage. Santi, Manuel Barberi. Um, my question is in terms of assistive technology. And I think one of the gaps that was highlighted was the fact that these assistive technologies are extremely um, expensive. However, we do know that they are important, especially given the whole globe centering a lot of whatever we want to do on tech. So my question would be, are there interventions or there policies that can be made that can ensure that not only just donors or publishers are the ones who are driving these resources towards these assistive technologies, but the government itself can also highlight or set a few particular parts of the resources into enabling these assistive technologies to be available for the persons with disabilities? Would we take those ones, Kwanza? Sour, sour. Hello? 
Uh, so thank you very much. Um, my colleague there mentioned about um, the stigma that was meted on a, on, on a, a person with disability who visited an education institution. And this actually portrays the existing attitudinal barriers that are existing uh, within the community. What is happening is many persons with disabilities face a lot of stigma within their communities, a lot of labeling, and that happens even to their own families, that families are assumed to have done or have not done something, and that is why this is happening. And you see, this is very deeply engraved in our cultural, um, you know, our cultural attitudes and beliefs towards disability. So what can we do? Uh, and this is a call to action for all of us, you know, we, we, I know we are young people, we have social media uh, platforms, we have platforms where we engage people and comment on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I would say that uh, UDPK is taking a lead in terms of awareness raising and advocacy, but we, um, breaking barriers is a continuous process. You know, what is happening is many people have a negative perception towards disability, but I can tell you that um, Persons with disabilities have equal rights as others, you know. And when it, it comes to issues like inclusive education, it's inclusive quality education for all. It does not discriminate or take into account uh, uh, anything else. It says inclusive education for all. So when we are providing services, it's providing services for all. When we are serving clients within our institutions, we serve all clients, you know, without discriminating them. Because Article 27 of the Constitution is very clear on non-discrimination. Nobody should be, uh, should, uh, should uh, be discriminated against on the basis of their disability, you know. And so uh, we have a responsibility to break the barriers. We have a responsibility to change the narrative. And I like uh, the Twitter account of UDPK because um, continuously there has been a continuous messages, messaging that breaks the barriers um, and teaches about disability etiquette, you know. We can take the initiative also to learn about disability etiquette, the, the, the right conversations, the right words to use in situations and circumstances. And then we take a lead at a personal level within the communities where we are to champion for inclusivity, to champion and ensure that persons with disabilities can transition within the community, can live independently and be accommodated and supported. You know, it's a personal initiative when we leave this place, we tell ourselves that I will leave this place and I will be able to become a better advocate. And let's use our social media platforms. Let's use all the platforms that we have because it's not a one person conversation, it's an all persons conversation. And I like, I would also encourage young people with disabilities to self advocate and be on the lead and take up the opportunities that are coming up, whether it's yearly, you know, the young um, uh, young, Africa. young African Readers Initiative, whether it's uh, the, the Disability Inclusion Facilitators Initiative, whether it's the UNICEF Initiative that was coming up, all initiatives that, uh, even if even the initiatives being done by the International Disability Alliance and UDPK, so that you have the requisite uh, information to be able to self-advocate in your space and to recognize that you have rights like everyone else. You know, God is the giver of rights. Nobody here has given a right to everyone. When we are born, we are born with inherent rights. We come here with rights that are God-given at birth, you know. And so nobody can discriminate anyone else on the basis of disability. I also wanted to comment on assistive technology. I know there's an initiative that is ongoing. There has been difficulties when it comes to matters of rehabilitation and habilitation, and it has gone on for quite some time, and many persons with disabilities have experienced a lot of challenges when it comes to access to assistive technology across all domains of disability. You know, it's not uh, specific to one domain of disability, but it's across all domains of disability. But I would say, what is the government doing? I know somebody asked, can a policy framework be sent in place? And I know there's a, there's a continuing process uh, that is happening. 
uh, on development of guidelines for provision of assistive technology. It's a government-led initiative. Of course, uh, we do not know the status at this point in time, but we know there is something that is happening. We know there is something that is happening when it comes to provision of mobility devices, and we know uh, in the current budget, the government set aside some certain funding to uh, empower KISE, the Kenya Institute of Special Education, and uh, the Jomo Kenyatta University to also provide assistive technology. But then we we ha we know uh, historically there has been a leaning towards mobility devices. And we know uh, that uh, that we need to do much more when it comes to the deaf community. We need to do much more when it comes to persons with visual disabilities, persons with intellectual disabilities, autistic persons who are non-speaking and minimally speaking, who require alternative and argumentative communication devices. So we know that um, there's a lot of leaning towards provision of mobility devices, and probably that is historical uh, because um, disabilities Disability, we say, is 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 um, is dynamic. It's it, you know, so, so many changes are happening within society, and disabilities that never used to be considered as disability are now considered as disability. It's 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 um, it's a development issue, but we would want also to see fat set aside to ensure that. Uh, provision of assistive de uh, assistive devices is across all domains of disability. And how can you do that? Also ensure that persons with disabilities are involved in all the processes that discuss assistive technology so that you know what are their needs. You know, a person with a visual disability requires uh, specific uh, um, areas, you know, uh, you know, they are, they, this is what they require, you know, within specifications. This is what probably uh, a person with um, with autism will require in terms of uh, uh, communication, you know. So, so we need to take care of the interests of everyone so that we have designs that are universally oriented, that take care of the needs of persons across all domains of disability, you know, because we recognize that as many children are being denied an opportunity to get even into the education setting because they did not have an assistive technology. We have children who require wheelchairs with cerebral palsy and other uh, um, uh, difficulties, but then they cannot access school, the school system because they do not have. Uh, an assistive device. They probably require a wheelchair to take them from from home to school. You know, so assistive technology is an enabler. So, so we cannot we cannot um, discuss, put this conversation on the table without persons with disability sitting at the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anis, for elaborating that. And she's talked about very key aspects in terms of what we are doing in terms of advocacy and also the, the very important aspect of breaking the barriers. And in terms of barriers, we usually talk about, for us, we usually break them into different components. And the one that has, is really, it's widespread and it has been brought out very clearly today is the barrier on attitudes. And of course, this is a collaborative effort. We as UDPK, we as organizations of persons with disabilities cannot do it by ourselves, but it has to be a collaborative effort by all of us to ensure that we we are all very intentional on including persons with disabilities in all aspects of the society. Not because it is it is it, it's be, on the on the main on the sorry is on that it is it is it is the right thing to do, and maybe just to also. Um, um, uh, highlight the, the whole conversation around um, the limited resources in schools, especially the ones the, the the ones for the visual impairment. And of course, and we were to have a panelist from the Directorate of Special Needs Education, but unfortunately, he was not able to make it. So maybe um, Joseph could just respond in terms of what we are doing as organizations of persons with disabilities in terms of advocacy, just to, you know, we're the ones who keep government on check. So just what we've been doing around advocacy um, to ensure that that allocation has been increased. Thank you so much. With the conversation we've had with the Minister of Education and specifically the Directorate of Special Needs Education, because that is the entity that is charged with looking into the welfare of learners with disabilities in our uh, basic learning institutions, that is the primary schools and the secondary schools, most of the special schools that we have uh, within our country. 
we grappling with a huge challenge because the budget uh, that uh, they're granted is very, very low. It can't take care of even the population that we have within our special schools. And, it, uh, and this knowledge gets to inhibit our growth and development in terms of resource allocation, the necessary uh, manpower provision, infrastructural enhancement, you know, like, and even the city technology issues that we are discussing about. And so that poses a huge challenge in terms of our development. Another aspect that I would really want, to, the Madame who talked about uh, uh, a sibling with the uh, a sibling who's deaf. I, I want to underscore that we're having a challenge within our education infrastructure, and even as of now, the the uh, the, the ministry uh, in in a uh, in a uh, coalition with the working together with the ministry, uh, working together with the parliament, they've introduced even a bill at the moment, the university's amendment bill, that is proposing the scrapping of diploma and certificate courses within our universities so that they are domiciled within our colleges which will also be another disaster. Because when you look into this, uh, the higher number of student disabilities we have in our universities are not even those pursuing degrees. Most of them are those who are pursuing diplomas and certificate courses. And these, they have confidence within our universities because one, we have good, system, good systems, especially the funding system, two is the transition system for them to you know, like start from pursuing their certificate courses to diploma and even to degree. That now, when now the courses are to be domiciled within our uh, within our colleges and uh, tivets, it's a huge challenge because without the proper infrastructure, without the proper technological systems, it will be a huge challenge. And Madam, I know we'll get to link up from here moving forward because we are organizing for a session with the Ministry of Education, the players within that uh, prospect, and even the stakeholders, be it the higher education loan board the Kenya University and the, uh, the College Central Placement Service that is charged with the res responsibility of placing these students, that we must have a discussion on how do we you know, like, set up a, a suitable platform or a suitable avenue to enhance the placement of learners with disabilities. Because even as of now, I am sure that our colleagues with disabilities, COOPS doesn't even know the number of student disabilities that apply for courses within our, within our systems or within their systems. Because they don't, one, they don't have the disability insert, and two, these you know, like again impairs even the allocation of resources. Because if I don't know that uh, the, the number of students with disability, those on wheelchair, those who are visually impaired, and those uh, who are deaf, if I don't know their specific number, how will I ensure that the universities that are, they are going to enable, you know, like, can allocate necessary resources, can allocate necessary manpower to support their development. And so we'll get to work hand in hand because when you're having these sessions, as a caregiver, you, your voices must also be heard because it's not just about us alone. And I want to stem around the issue about my colleague who asked about what the society needs. I have to tell you this. It's not about what the society needs. It's about what the society needs to take from now henceforth. Because... Uh, you know, like 15 years ago, I got into this world as a person's ability. I led my life, and you know, we are, we, I was privileged to be with him in the same primary school. Up to 10 years old, I didn't have disability. And I got, uh, after 10 years, up to now, I've you know, like lived to, uh, as a person's ability. That, tell, uh, that, does, uh, that tells you the fact that, uh, not, uh, the, you know, like when I look into the documents I've filled, I have never filled any document to apply to be a person with disability. I got myself here not through application, and so nobody will ever, you know, like present your letter to apply so that you become person with ability. You'll only fill a form to apply to be recognized by the government to be a person with ability, and so that tells you that it's, it's something that you don't plan. Uh, you don't plan for. If it comes, it comes. You have to live with it, and so awareness or engagement needs to be enhanced to the society at large, so that we tell off, uh, you know. Of you know, like uh, the possibilities that arise uh, beyond whatever you see uh, that uh, whatever beyond whatever you see as disability, so that the society you know like takes in consideration that we have persons abilities in our midst. These are people who, not, who need not any form of sympathy, but rather they need uh, the the ground to be leveled for them to pursue their interests and get to uh, another level in terms of enhancing their skill set, building themselves and enhancing their development. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Joseph, for that. And I think he's also brought it out very clearly, the aspects around institutional barriers that we have that limit um, the allocation, allocation, allocation of adequate resources to our, our um, educational facilities. And also just to, just to also chime in um, on the question that um, our colleague mentioned uh, concerning the deaf, 
um, as UDPK, we work very closely with our member organizations, and we could also, uh, maybe after the session, you could visit our tent, we could link you with, we have Kenya National Association for the Deaf, and we have Deaf Empowerment Kenya. All these are associations that work specifically on creating awareness and advocating for the rights of of. Um, persons who are deaf within the Kenyan society and we could always link you up so that you can be able to get information in terms of how have they been working around such situations and I know um, um, bar barriers in terms of communication and access are a big issue especially for the deaf community and then that, that linkage and of course also with my colleague here who heads the universities and colleges students association would go a long hand in assisting you even as we, we create awareness and we try to ensure that um, persons with diverse disabilities are included. So and that was it, guys. I hope you have learned something. Yeah. Uh, because after that, it was just a vote of thanks. And then um, other panels were to take up the stage after the dances, of course. Yeah. All play without work and all work without play is not good <laughs> now the problem is when you put is when me a dancer i'm supposed to to be recording people who are dancing and the music is uh whoo, boiling my blood it was not easy oh but i did it i tried no wonder it's all shaky and everything <laughs> all right catch you on the next one my loves do like subscribe share and leave your positive comments i love you so 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 much um i'll put for you i think day three perhaps and day four or maybe i'll match them together we'll see okay i hope you've enjoyed this one see you on the next one and